Why don't you grab your Bible and turn with me into the Psalms of Ascents. And some of you know where they are. <laughs> Psalm 120 through 134 is the Psalms of Ascents. We began last Wednesday night on a, the first several, uh, and we were kind of making our way through. Hopefully, I want to get through them tonight because, you know, they, they would have kind of seen it more as a clump. You know, they wouldn't just, uh, sit, you know, spend all these weeks talking about it. They'd be singing these psalms on their journey up to the Temple Mount. So we left off on Psalm 129. Uh, this, so we'll start there this evening, Psalm 129. We'd like to welcome the Salem Wednesday Nighters down at Corbin University, uh, Athey Creek Salem. You guys are down there. <laughs> Glad to have you here. That's good. <laughs> good stuff. And uh, um, we're going to be uh, getting in the scriptures tonight about what did they do um, when they came up to Jerusalem. And it's amazing to me the different topics. We've already covered several. Um, we saw the topic of family last week uh, in chapters you know, 127 and 128, you know, about the, the Lord building the house. And if you, if, unless the Lord builds the house, you're laboring in vain. That's what the scriptures say. And that's what they would say to themselves as they'd walk up to the hill of Jerusalem there to the mount. Uh, they, they, they'd have these constant reminders. And so we've, we've seen that. And, and other, you know, uh, lifting your eyes up to the Lord, you know, where your help comes from. And, and reviewing the history of the Jews and that's the kind of stuff they did with these psalms so far. That's what we've looked at. But here in Psalm 129, this sort of is um, a psalm that reminds me of the trouble of the Jews. Um, and uh, they sure have had their share, haven't they? The Jews throughout the centur centuries, even the millennia. You know, um, whether it was, you know, uh, Pharaoh uh, or Hadrian, uh, you know, or Hitler or Hillary. I mean, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I mean, there were all kinds of people that didn't like the Jews and were not very nice to the Jews. <laughs> um, I, do, I do think it's important to know that um, love them or hate them, our, our current president has been about as friendly to Jews in Israel as any president I've ever seen of our country's history, which is kind of interesting. Um, and especially as it relates to um, what the Bible says about treating the Jews. The nations that treat Israel were going to be blessed. The nations that, you know, diss Israel are going to be, well, they're going to they're go through some trouble. I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. And the Jews, as they're making their way up to the mountain, they start off with these words. It says here in verse 1, Psalm 129, verse 1, Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth. May Israel now say, many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. Hmm. Boy, isn't that true? Um, the Jews being, you know, under the taskmasters of Egypt, being slaves there in Egypt under Pharaoh's taskmasters. And man, and you know, if it wasn't that, then it was, you know, Haman who wanted to ex exterminate the entire people of Israel. If it wasn't for the Lord raising up Esther for such a time as this, if you recall, where the Lord used Esther uh, to save her people from, you know, that Haman, the, the guy that wanted all the Jews killed. And man, that was, that was a close call back in those days. If you know your history, the Jews over and over. In fact, I was reading the other day again about the, you know, the Black Plague and how the Jews in Europe were blamed for that. They took Jews because, interestingly enough, the Jews were not seemingly uh, affected by the Black Plague. While, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were dying from the plague, the Jews weren't. So they blamed the Jews and burned them at the stake. They grabbed their Jew, Jewish people out of their houses in parts of Europe and burned them at the stake because they thought they were the problem. Now, we know now that it was because the Jews had their practices of cleanliness out of the Jewish law. They actually washed their hands and there was a cleanliness ritual that they would go through that kept them from getting the plague. Isn't it interesting that, that throughout the ages, the Jews, been, their backs have been plowed upon by the world. But what's even more amazing is when you look at how much they've contributed to the world. And, and this is where the Bible, I, I just love it when the Bible is proven right time and time again. 
God told Abraham there in Genesis chapter 12, let me read it to you. In Genesis 12, 2, it says, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thee great, thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This is the Abrahamic covenant God made to Abraham that out of he and Sarah would come a nation of people and they'd be blessed uh, as a people. But also it says, I will, I will be a ble- make you a blessing to the world. He says that in verse two. And then he says, and of, of thee will all the families of the earth be blessed. What a radical and powerful uh, promise that has totally come to pass. Have the Jews really been a blessing to the world? Well, let me, let me just tell you some interesting things about the Jews. Uh, Jews who were Nobel Prize winners worldwide from the uh, time of Nobel in 1901 to 2018 in the scientific research fields of chemistry, economics, physics, physiology, and medicine, um, the, um, the corresponding world and U.S. percentages are uh, 26 and 39 percent, respectively. Of organizations awarded the Nobel Prize, 21 percent of the organizations were founded principally by the Jews. Now, this is interesting because uh, since the turn of the century, uh, you know, like 2000 and onward, Jews have been awarded 25% of all the Nobel, uh, the Nobel Prizes, and 28% of those were in scientific fields of research. Um, you say, okay, that's great, good for the Jews, 20, 25, 28% of all the Nobel Prizes. It's interesting, though, because the Jews currently make up 0.2% of the world's population. That, that tells you just a little something. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because you can break it down. Chemistry, there were 36 Jews, um, uh, pardon me, 36 prize winners, uh, uh, 20% uh, of the world total, 29% of U.S. total. Um, in economics, 32 Jewish prize winners, uh, 40% of the world total. Is that a shock that the Jews had uh, awards in economics? Uh, 40% of the world uh, of the Nobel Prize winners. Uh, uh, The Nobel Peace Prize, nine Jewish people were winners for that. 8% was the world total, total, uh, 10% U.S. total. Uh, In physics, there were 55 Nobel Prize winners. uh, And and in physiology uh, and medicine, 56 prize winners. It's just interesting that when you look at it, uh, no other people group... uh, and even come close to the Jews when it comes to science, medicine, uh, chemistry, economics, as far as the world acknowledging, yeah, these guys have offered more than anybody else, by far, not even close. Um, You know, it's interesting when you look at the talent of of Jews. I mean, um, I was kind of going through a list of Jewish comedians over the years. Um, Adam Sandler, Goldie Hawn, Joan Rivers, Billy Crystal, Ben Stiller, Seth Rogen, Jerry Seinfeld, Mel Brooks, Jerry Lewis, Don Rickles, Rodney Dangerfield, Gilda Radner, Jack Benny, uh, Buddy Hackett, Danny Kay. Like, I could go on and on. There's hundreds and hundreds of famous comedians. Isn't it interesting that some of the most oppressed people that have ever lived on the earth are also some of the funniest? The comedians, uh, which is interesting. Now, of those nations that have treated the Jews bad, it's not just the, you know, the Germans and Hitler. That was obviously a real precipice of evil back in World War II, of course. But one of the things that I find an interesting study, and and there's people that have written books on this, this topic, but they track and trace the nations and their behavior toward Israel and how those nations did after they disrespected Israel or treated Israel badly. Um, Let me give you one that you may not have really thought that much about. The British. You know, the British Empire was giant. You you might argue that at its peak, the British Empire was perhaps one of the biggest empires ever in the history of the world. Like, like if you really know the, the history there, it's kind of amazing. The British were everywhere. Um, look it up sometime. You'll be shocked at where the British really had, they, they conquered, they ruled, uh, and, and uh, much, much, much of the globe they had. In fact, at their peak, they had 25% of the landmass of the world. Um, that's a pretty big deal. 
one, one nation. And they were at their great power, and then something happened. And, and now, you know, as much as we, you know, love the British and everything, we kind of look at them today as just a little island kind of over there, uh, off of Europe there, somewhere by Fran France. What, what, what happened to the British Empire, the mighty, huge British Empire? Well, I, I've got a suggestion for you. Do you want to know when the Brits fell off the wagon when it came to the, being a, you know, a, a giant power in the world? It was in World War II, largely. It started, you might say it's kind of started in World War I. Um, and the treatment, you know, the British, of course, had Jerusalem and Israel. Um, the Brits were there, and there was not a real kind treatment for the Jews. And there's all kinds of things we could talk about, the, the history, uh, the British mandate, and some of the things that happened there in Israel. But basically, the Brits uh, didn't want a Jewish nation. That when they kind of ran out, uh, were sort of driven out of, of Israel, they sort of said, we want an Arab Jewish state, uh, but, but we don't want the Jews having their own state. And if you recall, did anybody, maybe you older folks, you saw the movie Exodus. There was something that happened there in World War II that was pretty painful. Um, and that is the, the Jews that were able to flee the Nazis in Europe. They had nowhere to go. Um, and so many of them wanted to go to, at that time, it was called Palestine. Um, but do you remember, who were the ones who blockaded the Jews so that they couldn't go into Palestine? None other than the Brits. The British would not allow the Jews to go into their land, um, and they had to turn them around to go to their deaths uh, to the German concentration camps. It was a really bad scene. Study your history. It was an interesting movie called The Exodus that if you ever want to see it, kind of tells that story of what happened there. But if you, if you look at history, that's where the Brits lost their edge. That's where they started to kind of fall and shrink as a nation and become sort of a, a wimpy little nation. That's just what happened. And, and you'll find that not just with the Brits, but any nation that treats the Jews badly turns on Israel or treats them badly, the, the, the word of God is always true. And that's why I have to say, I, I, even though, you know, love him or hate him, I do like that we have a president that supports Israel right now. And, and I think we're seeing economic blessing right now. We're seeing all kinds of interesting prosperity that some people don't want to acknowledge, but it's just the way it is. But could it be that while we have that, we're going to be blessed as a nation? Even though we're a sinful nation, just like the Brits were and just like all the other nations, but, but if you treat Israel good, that, that's good, good policy right there, biblically speaking. Now, whether our president knows that or not, that's a debate. But all that to say, many a time have they afflicted me, they said, the Jews, as they went up the mountains of Israel there to Jerusalem. And that is true historically. Um, but all that said, this psalm is, is talking about how that happened both in the past, but it would happen still yet in the future as well. Uh, that's the Jewish history. Verse four, the Lord is righteous. He hath cut asunder the cords of the wicked. Let them all be confounded and turn back that hate Zion. Um, let them be confounded. This is, this is what they were saying. Those nations that hate us, let them be confused and confounded. And that's where it's interesting to watch. You know, um, if you, if you want to look at a, a people group that hasn't contributed to the Nobel Peace Prize, and I'm not, not saying this to knock them as much, it's just how many Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize have, have belonged to Muslims? If you actually look for that, what you find is mostly, mostly ch uh, you know, um, crickets chirping. That's pretty much it. There's almost nothing there, which I'm not saying, you know, some of the smartest people in the world were, um, you know, uh, some of our, uh, you know, Muslim nations, you know, in uh, ancient Persia, considered to be some of the smartest people in the world, but have today a real hatred for the Jews. And you see this backwardness and this sadness, uh, people that are suffering and that are oppressed um, and it's largely, I think, because of a real hatred for God's people. Um, and you don't see Nobel Peace Prize coming from most of the Muslim nations. That's just the truth. You don't see a lot of science awards or chemistry. or You don't see a ton of that right now. But uh, the Jews have been blessed and the nations that bless Israel 
Let them be confounded. That's what the Lord does. That's what it says right here in the Bible. Verse six, let them be as the grass upon the housetops, which withereth afore it groweth up. Um, in Bible times, when this was originally written, they had uh, sort of mud roofs that would get sort of weeds growing on their roofs because the seeds would fall on the roofs. But they would grow up and then be scorched by the sun and wither away. The idea is very temporary, not very fruitful or long-term. Um, wherewith, verse 7, the mower filleth not his hand, nor he that bindeth sheaves in his bosoms. In other words, it's not, it's not a fruitful grass that's growing. Neither, verse 8, do they which go by say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. See, this is the thing. I will bless the nations that bless Israel and I will curse the nations that curse Israel. And by the way, the Jews were called to bless one another. They were supposed to bless each other. What a lesson for you and me. Uh, how are we at blessing other people? Do you walk around just saying blessing to people? Um, would you keep your finger here and turn with me to Numbers chapter six? I wanna show you where the, the Lord tells them the form of blessing, how they were supposed to do it when they were blessing each other. It's in Numbers chapter six. This might look familiar to some of you, especially you Wednesday nighters. Numbers chapter six, verse 22. There in number six, 22, the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak unto Aaron and to his son saying, on this wise shall ye bless the children of Israel saying unto them, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. This here is the blessing. You know, it's interesting uh, that they were to bless the children, but not blasting. Some of us are good at blasting. You know, where we blast away at people when we get upset, and that's a hard thing. But instead of blasting, you and I are called to be people of blessing. That's what the Jews were, and we've been grafted into this vine of the Jews. You and I are called to be a people of blessing. Um, and so here, this is how they were supposed to do it. And by the way, um, what we read here in the Psalm of Ascents, in Psalm 129, where it says, we bless you in the name of the Lord, it was an abbreviated, really, version of what was there from Numbers chapter 6. And they would go around and say, the Lord bless thee. And then they'd all say, yeah, number six, we get it. We know what you're saying. It was like they would say that in sort of an abbreviated term so that they could uh, move quickly. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. May cause his face to shine upon thee. See, that, that's a long way of saying it. Um, by the way, in those, those blessings of number six, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is kind of interesting. The Holy Trinity is right there. And where it says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. That's the Father. That's Jehovah. The Lord bless thee. And then the second one, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee um, and be gracious. Where do we get grace? It comes from Jesus Christ. And he's the one where we see the face of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus, because of the cross, brings us grace, salvation. Um, so the Lord bless thee and keep thee. That's the Father. Be gracious uh, unto you and, and shine upon you face. That's, that's Jesus. That's the Son. But the Spirit is the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. That's what the Holy Spirit does, is the comforter and gives you peace. I love the, the uh, Trinity that's seen right there in those, um, those three uh, blessings that the Jews were supposed to give to each other. And that's really what's, what's being spoken of here in Psalm 129. So while the rest of the world is cursing the Jews, the Jews were called to bless each other. Uh, maybe that's a good word for us as we see the times changing as Christians, where the world is very uh, excited about cursing Christian people. I mentioned a few weeks ago, if you, if you haven't seen George Clooney and, and Bill Nye, the science guy, they, they did a paid you know, advertisement of just basically cursing people of Christian faith um, and, uh, you know, just blasting away. And, and Bill Nye was, I can't believe I taught you kids blankety blank. And he just rails on, on and it's supposed to be funny, I think. Um, but it's perhaps as a Christian, you know, one of the most offensive things you, you'll ever see. Um, how many of you guys actually saw that? Raise your hand. Anybody? 
wow, only a few. Okay, so good. It's not getting out there. I just publicized it, though. That's a bummer. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just kind of where things are going. And Holly Weird is going to be at the head, head of that. You just trust me on that. That's, we'll see that more and more. Uh, real cursing of Christianity. That's what we're starting to see. Well, that's Psalm 129. The next psalm uh, is Psalm 130, verse 1. It says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Now, some of you might think this seems redundant to say, Lord, hear my prayers. And what are they doing? They're praying. Why would you pray to the Lord and say, Lord, hear my prayers? Um, well, the answer to that is another study that we've done in the scriptures. Do you guys remember where we've done some teachings about blocked prayers or the prayer that fails to reach the ears of God? And uh, I've done several of those over the years. Um, just, just look up online if you want to see those teachings called blocked prayers. There's a teaching, I think, called that, um, or hindered prayers or something like that. Um, but there's several things that will make your prayer fail to reach the ear of God. Um, the Bible tells us that. Um, you know, one, if you have unconfessed, undealt with sin in your life, your, your prayer will fail to fly. Um, you know, just if you're just sinning willingly without confession, then the Lord's ears are blocked. That's what the Bible says. There's a bunch of interesting ones. If you um, have unforgiveness in your heart toward someone, your prayer will fail to fly. If you're a husband and you're not treating your wife um, you know, as, as Peter, you know, says that husbands dwell with their wives according to knowledge, you know, giving, you know, honor to the wife as under the weaker vessel, weaker meaning fragile, but, but beautiful. Um, and, and it says, unless you do that, your prayers are going to be hindered. You're going to be in trouble. So there's, there's some things in the Bible, if you ask amiss and stuff like that, that's why you can say at the beginning of a prayer, Lord, please hear my prayer. Um, because there's things that can't actually stop prayer. What's the best way to make sure your prayers are, are going? Man, start with confession. Lord, forgive me for my sins, and then acknowledge your sin before the Lord. And, and as you confess, he's faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you, give you a brand new start, and then you know your prayers are clear. But that's why they would say this, oh Lord, I've cried unto thee, Lord, hear my voice. Let, my, let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Very important. Verse 3, if thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Rhetorical question here that's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's, it's this question about, uh, man, if, if the Lord marks iniquities, who shall stand? You know, Satan is evil compared to the Lord. Don't you love this? Because Satan, man, he's keeping a list. and I mean Satan. Uh, uh, Santa. I meant Santa. Um, red suit, you know, change a few letters around. I'm just saying. Uh, no. S Santa keeps a list. And he checks it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and nice. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't do that? What does Jesus do with our list of sins? Man, there's several language things that I love in the Bible. One of the things that says he blots out our sins. Don't you love that? I like that image, just all my list of sins. Blot, blot, blot. Um, you know, in Micah, cha uh, uh, chapter 7, uh, I think verse 19, it says that he takes our sins and puts them in, in, uh, in the sea and puts them in the depths of the sea where no one can bring them up out of the sea. I love that image. Man, the, you know, the... Uh, Mariana's Trench there in the, in the ocean, just the depths of the ocean. That's where your sins are. Uh, the Bible talks about how he puts his, your sins as far as the east is from the west. It talks about how he'll remember your sins no more. He forgives and forgets. He's not like Santa. He's better than that. He, he takes that list and blots it out. That's if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, there's a list, and it's not a happy list. And you're going to be held to that list. But the believer, the one who confesses their need for salvation, um, man, the Lord takes your sins and he remembers them no more. It's the glorious part of being a Christian, knowing that you're forgiven, that you're saved by his grace. Man, I love that. Um, so that's, that's really important to know um, that your sins are blotted out. So it's true. It's a rhetorical question. Lord, if you keep marking our iniquities, who can stand? The answer, no one. No one can stand if the Lord 
holds our sins against us, keeps a list, checks it twice, because we already know who's naughty and nice. But thank the Lord, he doesn't do that. But there's forgiveness with the Lord. Now, there's a, there's a little phrase I don't want to miss, though, in verse 4. But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. See, here's where the balance comes in, and it's important. Because once you realize you're saved by his grace through faith and that he forgives you, that his mercies endure forever, once, once you got that down, man, it's so cool. But here's the temptation, and you'll hear people criticize this. They'll say, oh, you people at Athey Creek, you're into a cheap grace. That's what they call it. Cheap grace. Your sins are forgiven, and Jesus died for your sins. So you can just sin it up. Keep sinning, and then the grace of God forgives you. So party down. Well, is that really what we teach here at Athey Creek? Uh, no. Uh, we talk more about sin here at Athey Creek than most churches that I know of, uh, because sin is still bad. And why is sin bad? Is sin bad just because it's bad? God says it's bad, so it's bad. No, the Bible tells us and teaches us kind of generally through the Bible, the reason something's called sin is because it hurts you and messes you up. Oh, I, I, this is a hard one for me lately. I've noticed the last couple of years, I've noticed that there's a real disparity in people understanding what sin is. Whenever I talk about sin, there's some people, well, how can you say I sinned? How can you call me a sinner? And, and I'm shocked that you're shocked. Because just about everything you and I do is sin. Do you understand that? Like almost everything we do. Well, Brett, I think I'm not so sinful as you. Oh, that's sinful, thinking that you're not sinful. <laughs> Man, sin means to miss the mark. How much did we miss the mark today? It's, it's almost infinite. Um, see, and here's the problem. People get all offended when you call something sinful. I don't think that's sinful. But it is. Uh, and it's, we, we think we have our own little sense of sin. Well, adultery, murder, uh, robbery, if you steal something. Of course, as, uh, Bernie Sanders said today he'd like to legalize theft. I, I don't know if you guys heard that in his speech, but that'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we, we call the big honking sins sins. Um, but but, uh, but it, do you understand? It's even the little tiny sins that are, you and I, worthy of death bad attitudes, wrong motivations, even stuff that might not even be like intentional. We can do sort of unintentional. There was actually special sacrifices for the Jews for their unintentional sins. Um, you know, just in case they didn't cover it all in their intentional sins, they made sure and did other sacrifices for the unintentional sins. And they were still called sin though. That's the funny thing. Anything that misses the mark. Now the reason I harp on that is because those that would say, hey, you guys teach a cheap grace. You sin it up. No. We teach that we're saved by grace and the Lord puts our sins away and hides them in the sea, all those good things. But we also teach what Paul warned about there when he warned, should we continue in sin then? He asked that question sort of, you know, rhetorically, didn't he? In Romans chapter 6, he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Again, it's a rhetorical question. And he answers it, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, when you're saved by God's grace through faith, going to heaven, not anything you deserve, nothing you earned, it's all God's gift to you, then why would you, who you, you died to sin, man, you, you, you're, you repented, you said, that's sin and I don't want to do that. Now, does that mean we're not going to struggle with sin? No, but... But the fact is, we're saved, our sins are forgiven, we're still going to struggle, we're still going to wrestle with sin, but if you're just saying, hey, I'm saved by grace, so I'm going to party down and sin it up, well, that's not real repentance. That's where you'd have to say, am I really regenerated? See, we're all wrestling with sin, but the question is, have you truly repented of your sin? And a repentant heart will say, that's wrong. And I'm going to wrestle against that. I'm going to fight against that. And when you engage in sinful behavior, you're, you're heartbroken by your own sin. You repent of your own sin. That's the difference. So there's kind of this false dilemma that some of these lordship theology kind of people tend to do and say, well, if you believe you're saved by grace um, alone, then it's a license to just keep sinning. Well, that's just not true. It's not what the Bible teaches, nor is it what, what we believe. We believe the whole Bible. 
And so James was right. Faith without works is dead. You're totally right. It's a result of a person being saved by God's grace through faith. You will see good works come. Not that they're going to be perfect or, or you know, without blemish or spot um, practically, but positionally in Christ, we are forgiven. I hope you see the difference there. Um, that's why we can walk in joy and liberty, but we also have work to do to follow the Lord. Well, all that to say, uh, that I see that here in both uh, the, the phrases, verse four, but there is forgiveness with thee, praise the Lord for that, that thou mayest be feared. There's sort of linked to that, that healthy fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom that I think is, is part of that equation. Well, verse five, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. <laughs> now, who are they that watch for the morning? There's two theories. The psalmist here is probably either talking about A, a soldier who's supposed to watch through the night at a gate entry in the city. And he's supposed to watch to the morning. And he's supposed to stay awake and keep watch. Tough duty, man. Uh, many a soldier have fallen asleep on duty. Uh, trying to keep watch. Um, others say, no, this is probably a shepherd, a description of a shepherd who was supposed to watch the flocks by night, those that had the night shift. They had to keep watch lest the wolves come and have lamb chops for supper. Um, the, the shepherd had to be watching. But either way, the idea is keeping watch. It says, my soul waits for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. In other words, to stay alert and wait upon the Lord. The idea is, wait, it says it several times, um, wait, 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 I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, my soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch. Patience, long-suffering, waiting, that's a, such a key. Um, you know, you guys know the, the fancy scriptures, uh, maybe many of you have memorized, you know, Isaiah chapter 40, I love verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Who, who does all that? Those who wait upon the Lord. Are you a good waiter? Are you impatient? Um, man, that's a hard one to answer. Uh, ask somebody else, am I good at patience? <laughs> I love the poem. This one's really true. Patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Found seldom in a woman. And never in a man. <laughs> oh boy. It's true. Found seldom in a woman, but never in a man. That's true. Patience is a virtue. And it's, it's, a, it's a godly characteristic. And a lot of us are very much not patient. But the Bible teaches that. And I'm also thankful, by the way, for God's patience with us. Man, that's one of his attributes, that he's long-suffering to us, word, the Bible says, that he's patient with you. Even when you fail and make mistakes and over and over and over again, the Lord's still patient. And he's just there loving you, waiting for you to get back on track. Very patient. Thank the Lord for that. Well, verse seven, let Israel hope in the Lord for with the Lord there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The word redemption there, I love it, it's tied in with mercy. Mercy is forgiveness of sin. Redemption is a financial term. It's, it's that, you know, when you and I sin, suddenly we owe a debt and we sold ourselves out. But the word redemption, I've been redeemed, we sing the song, redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Jesus paid our price with the blood that was shed on the cross. Just like in Bible times, if they if they uh, sinned, they would have to bring a lamb and sacrifice that costly lamb. And it would be sort of a price of blood. And, and without blood sacrifice, there'd be no redemption of sin. So when Jesus died on the cross, that's the precious payment that was given for you and for me. And that's the word redeemed, redemption. You've been paid for. You owed a debt that you could not pay. He paid the debt that he did not owe. Um, but he did it for us because he loves us. Man, I love that. Well, Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things 
too high for me. Surely I've behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. So we looked at this on Sunday about humility. Uh, you know, my heart is not haughty, my eyes not lofty. Um, important, what an important thing. Um, several years back, I saw an example of someone who kind of did this in, in sort of an interesting way. As a, as a guitarist, I, I take note of these kinds of story, but um, apparently the Queen of England is not a big guitar fan. <laughs> and the reason why is she, they were honoring um, some British musicians, and there was a bunch of musicians there, um, you know, classical and, and um, jazz and rock and blues and all this stuff. But um, when she came up to Eric Clapton, um, she, she shook his hand and, and he, he sh you know, sh shook, shook her hand with great firmness and, and she said, oh, you're a guitarist. Have you been playing for a long time? <laughs> and Eric clapped and his reply was very humble. He says, hmm, it must be about 45 years now. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, that's great. Just kind of talking to the queen, you know, but uh, people are like, what? You don't know who Eric Clapton is? Come on, that's ridiculous. But uh, just very humble uh, before the Queen of England. Uh, you know, really, that's the thing. In light of God, when we stand before God, we have nothing to boast about. And, and that's why Sunday's teaching was so important. That you and I, man, this idea of humility, um, where does it come from? What does it look like? What does it sound like? That's why we kind of meditated on that on Sunday. If you missed it, you might want to go back and review because it's important. Well, Psalm 132. Um, now, this is an interesting uh, psalm of degrees or psalm of ascent, um, and it basically, most scholars ascribe it to David, even though it doesn't say a psalm of David, um, but um, you'll see David's name mentioned here, and for, so it's for sure largely about David, and it's got great messianic overtones, speaking of Jesus, the son of David, the descendant of David, but it also has to do with the Ark of the Covenant being brought back into Jerusalem, remember? David set his sights on bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, that those guys would be able to worship the Lord and have the presence of God there in Jerusalem, and it would be a, a, a beautiful time. But you remember the story. Tried to bring it up once, Uzzah in Ohio, driving the cart. And remember when Uzzah reached out and touched the, the Ark to stable it from falling? He was dead, and they stuffed the Ark in the house of Obed-Edom and ran for their lives. And the house of Obed-Edom was blessed for several months. And David's like, man, I want to bring the ark. How should I do it? Well, he checked out the law and realized, oops, we, sure, we weren't supposed to bring it on a, on a cart. That was the way the Philistines did it. By the way, David was trying to be, bring the ark of the covenant in, God's presence, to Jerusalem. And they were using the worldly techniques to do it. I think that's interesting to me. Um, and, and people died because of it. Um, the godly techniques was the priests were to carry the ark on poles. And you know the story. David ended up very humbly sacrificing every six steps. He'd stop, make a sacrifice, and then, then start moving forward again every six steps. Stop another sacrifice. A lot of, lot of uh, sacrifice, a lot of humility, and they brought the ark into Jerusalem. But that ark speaks of God's presence. I wonder if the church, if we're guilty of trying to use worldly techniques uh, to bring in the the presence of God, to muster up, you know, to puff air into our worship services, to make, ooh, if we can make things really fancy and flashy. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, you know, I have to be careful because the Lord uses all kinds of different things. But for me, I'm just going to say it this way. For me, um, one of the reasons you don't see smoke rolling off the stage on Sunday morning and laser lights flashing everywhere is because, I don't know, the only time I see that kind of stuff is at worldly stuff. You know, um, and, uh, you know, concerts and stuff that the world, like that's borrowing, to me, that's borrowing stuff. I just, for me, I just kind of like to say, hey, let's, let's make it more of our living room here. This is our church living room. Let's worship the Lord with song. Uh, yeah, but Brett, you could argue then you shouldn't be using electric guitars because that's the devil's instrument or drums. The world uses that. I understand there's, you know, we can make all these arguments and people do. And, and there's some great churches that have smoke and lights. Uh, that love Jesus. Um, but I think it has less to do with the actual using the worldly stuff, but it has to do with your intention behind how you're using those things. 
if we're saying, hey, we're going to be the hippest, coolest church in Portland, we're going to have the, you know, <laughs> all the smoke and the lights, and it'll be flashing and lasers and uh, dancing bears and all kinds of fun stuff. Well, um, I don't think that's going to work. I think the Lord's presence, I think people are going to die with that one, especially if we tried that. Because it's just not who God's made us, me, at our church to be like that. So you've got to kind of go with what's kind of your natural, just, just do what God's called you to do, and I think that's important. Well, that's what happened. So all that to say that this psalm is kind of centered on that event of bringing the ark back, uh, his desire to bring the ark back and build the temple of the Lord. So it says in verse one, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swear unto uh, the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes nor slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it, that's the ark, at Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of the wood. Now this is probably referring to, remember when the Philistines had the ark and they took it from, from the guys, from King Saul, and they took it and put it in the Dagon temple? And uh, Dagon fell over and they got hemorrhoids. And so they shipped the, uh, it's a long story. They shipped the ark back on a cart with a couple of cows. And the cows just wandered aimlessly over the, the southern regions of Israel there from the Gaza Strip today over into um, uh, Beth Shemesh. And, um, and as they, uh, this little cart ran, the Jews are like, hey, what's that cart coming over? Hey, what's, what's that on the cart? That's the Ark of the Covenant. Can you imagine if you're a Jew? Um, what you would do about that? Well, the, the, the men there, they took the ark and said, let's look inside. And they did, and thousands of people died. That's, the, that was, um, that's why in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, remember when they opened the ark and everybody's eyeballs melted? Oh, all that stuff. And they got that from that story of the Bible, um, if you're just wondering. Um, those men shouldn't have opened the ark. Why? Because it was the Levites and it was the sons of uh, Aaron that were responsible for taking care of the ark. Those guys were not doing what the Bible said. So that's what they did. They just found this ark. And that's kind of what's being referred to. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata, and we found it in the fields of the wood. Uh, so let's bring this ark back to Jerusalem. Now, by the way, David's longing is a good one. Oh, Lord, he says, how he sweared, Lord, and vowed, I will not come to the tabernacle of my own house. The idea is I don't want to even go home and sleep in my own bed with my own pillow. Um, uh, until I, I um, find a place for the Lord, a, a place for him to dwell. Um, question, how can you and I build a place for God to dwell? Is, there, is that even a possibility? The Lord inhabits the what? The praises of his people. See, you and I do have a role that's kind of fun if you think about it. Um, to bring a place for the Lord to dwell. That's, that's an amazing thing that God says, tell you what, if you want to do something worthwhile, you can enthrone me on the praises of my people. You guys, by, by when we come together and sing praises to the Lord, the Lord says, I'm going to dwell in that place. David was wanting to build a literal temple and make a place for the Ark of the Covenant. Well, that, that's them in those days. That's great. But you and I should have that same desire that David had and say, Lord, we want you to be in this place. Um, you know, I, I wonder sometimes when churches go dead. Have you ever been to a church where you just sense, man, the Lord is not here? What's going on with that? Well, Brett, it's because there's no smoke and lights. No, that's not, that's not why. That's not it. Nope. A church goes dead when the people are there and they don't, they don't build a place for praise, and, and that's not, you know, concrete and rebar and, you know, nails and hammers. Building a place for praise is when, when we come and praise the Lord with our song and with our worship, worshiping and giving, worshiping and serving, um, and that's where you feel a church that's alive, and I love that I get to be a part of a church that has the life of Jesus here, and you can sense the presence of God here, but I want to tell you this, you and I, if we ever come here and this becomes, let's say we all just get really old and we all kind of go, yeah, whatever. Hey, we're gonna turn down those guitars. Stop playing that music. Yeah, we're gonna, if we start being that church, let's just get up and leave and go find where God is. Don't ever, you know, that's the problem. There's so many churches that they've tried to hang on and somewhere years ago, they forgot 
how to just enthrone the Lord on the praises of the people. Somewhere they left out the power of the Holy Spirit. Somewhere they forgot the, the authority of God's word. And there's just the life that can be sucked out of a church. And, and then I think there's a point where God says, not there anymore. It happened to the Jews. Remember when they lost the Ark of the Covenant? There was a woman that gave birth to a child and they named his name Ichabod. Ichabod, was he the headless horseman? Different guy, different guy. But does anybody remember what Ichabod means? Without the presence of God, no glory. Ich, kabod. The kabod was that glory that dwelt over the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. It was some kind of a presence of God that they could feel and they knew it was there. The kabod. Ich is the negative or there's no glory of God. And so she named, because God's presence was out of Israel, so she named her son Ichabod. Interesting, that, that there's a lot of churches that sadly, as the years go by and the members kind of lose touch with the Lord and don't have that, like the life of the church, there's a lot of Ichabod churches, sad to say. You find that around a lot of places in Europe where once there was a lively bunch of Christians who loved Jesus, you know, a century ago. But now it's just Ichabod. God forbid that that happens here. Well, all that to say, that's, that's why David was so passionate about getting that, that ark back into Jerusalem. Well, verse 7, we will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. I love this because, you know, this is what the Jews are hoping happens on the Temple Mount as they're making their way up to the Temple Mount. They're anticipating seeing God. In fact, what does their worship include? Hopefully the same things worship for you and for me include when we come to church uh, on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night or a Wednesday night. What is that? Well, there's four main things. Look at verse uh, 7. Number one, we will worship. That's one of the things you and I are called to do is worship. And then number two, it says, and the ark of thy strength, which speaks of God's presence, that, that we come to meet the Lord with his people. Well, Brett, I just like to meet God in my own house. You can do that, but there's something extraordinary and, bl and blessed when two or more gather in his name. I will be there in the midst, the Lord says. There's something about the gathering of God's people that is special. And when people say, no, I can just meet the Lord in my house, they're missing out on something that's really special. That's why they would gather the ark of the strength of God's presence. So you got worship, God's presence. Verse nine, let thy priest be clothed with righteousness. That's one of the things you and I do when we gather. We acknowledge that, man, our sins have been forgiven. We've been robed in righteousness. That's why we often take communion at the Lord's table, eating the bread and drinking the cup, remembering that our sins have been washed away and remembering that we're declared righteous. Same thing that they did, same hopes that they had, we get to experience as we worship. One more, um, it says, and let thy saints shout for joy. Man, I love that one. Can you imagine the Jews as they're anticipating on their way up to Jerusalem? Man, we're gonna get up there, we're gonna be righteous, we're gonna stand before the Lord of the tabernacle or the temple. Man, we're gonna, and, and we're gonna be, uh, you know, we're gonna be shouting for joy because of the righteousness that he gives. You know, what a, what a glorious experience these, these people were in for as they made their way up to Jerusalem. Verse 10, for thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. <clears throat> of the fruit of thy body will I set up on thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. Who's this talking about? Anybody? Verses 10 through 12 is speaking of something very specific. What, what is it? It's the same answer all through the Bible. Jesus! All right, there it is. Remember, thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face from thine anointed. Okay, now, now notice, the Lord has sworn in truth unto David there in verse 11. What's that called? The Bam, the Davidic covenant, good. You see, this is, this is like the Abrahamic covenant. 
the Abrahamic covenant that we started tonight on was God's promise to Abraham to work through the Jews and make a mighty nation and all the nations would be blessed. David got his own covenant and they call it the Davidic covenant, Bible scholars do. And that's where the Lord said, I will make from your seed, David, an everlasting throne in Jerusalem. And, and, and this is just a reminding of this. And, and the Jews knew this, that there would be uh, somewhere the son of David, a descendant of David that would come and have an everlasting throne from Jerusalem. So we call this part of this psalm the messianic section. Uh, speaking of the Messiah, Jesus, who was the son of David. Remember they called out Jesus, blind Bart. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Why did he call him that? Because he was a descendant of David. He was a rightful heir to the throne. Yeah, but Brett, did you notice here in verse 12, it said, if thy children keep my covenant and my testimony, did the Jews keep his covenant and testimony? Anybody? No. Oh no, does that mean the Davidic covenant is null and void? No. What it says here is if, verse 12, thy children will keep my covenant and testimony, that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forever. Have the Jews sat on the throne in Jerusalem forever? No. There's been a lot of years where other people have sat on thrones in Jerusalem because the Jews did not keep covenant. However, this was a reminder to the Jews that, man, you've got to keep the covenants of the Lord, the laws, the statutes, the commandments. And this was a reminder for them to do that. Otherwise, their children and their children's children wouldn't be sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. And for almost 2,000 years, the Jews wouldn't sit on that throne. From A.D. 70, when the Romans conquered Jerusalem, Titus the general came through and burned it up, killed a bunch of Jews. The Jews had no king on the throne. Um, and it's only now in modern times we're seeing the Jews ruling, uh, if you would, in Jerusalem. They still don't have the whole thing, though. Interestingly enough, the Jews, they still don't have the Temple Mount, the very place of the highest point of worship for the Jews. That's going to happen when the Messiah comes, the King, uh, the Son of David, spoken of here. That's an everlasting promise. The, the promise of the Jews having someone on the throne was conditional. But the Davidic covenant of having uh, the seed of David ultimately reigning, that was an unconditional covenant. Are you guys with me on that? That's an important thing to see. Well, verse 13, everybody should mark this verse. It's giant, it's huge. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. Zion is, you might say it this way, is an old word for Jerusalem. Uh, Mount Zion is Jerusalem. Uh, Zion is the Temple Mount. And so when people ask you, well, who should be able to be in Jerusalem? Is it the Palestinians or the Jews? You'd answer that and say, answer that and say Neither. The one who's supposed to be there is the Lord. The Lord has chosen Zion and he has desired it for his habitation. And it just so happens that he takes his city and says he wants the Jews to live there. <laughs> so does it belong to the Jews? No. Should the Jews live there? Yes. It belongs to the Lord. And he is the one who will be seated on that throne during the millennial kingdom. Well, verse 14, this is my rest forever. Here will I dwell for I have desired it. God desires to make his throne Jerusalem. That's just amazing to me, isn't it? I mean, it's just, I, I marvel that the Lord chooses a city that's kind of not the most beautiful city in the world, but he still chooses it. And, and you know what I love about that? There's a little bit of a picture there that makes me understand why God chose me. When I go to Jerusalem and I go, man, this is just a dusty, ancient city, um, I think that, you know, there's, there's, I think Portland is more beautiful than Jerusalem, frankly, in a lot of ways. But God didn't choose that. You know, God, you know, God chose Jerusalem just like he chose you. You're not that beautiful too, and neither am I. And the Lord says, you know, I choose who I want to choose. And Jerusalem is what he chose as a city, and I'm, I'm chosen as a person. And I can't explain it, just like I can't explain Jerusalem. But God chose us. I'm thankful for that. Chosen. Uh, we've been adopted sons and daughters. That's what the Bible tells us. Well, um, verse 15, I will abundantly bless her provision, Jerusalem. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, 
but upon himself shall his crown flourish. This is the second coming of Christ. And for you Bible prophecy buffs, there's all kinds of stuff here. The horn of David. Those of you who know Bible prophecy, there's some horns involved. The little horn and the ten horns and stuff like that. They're all, they're all counterfeits. There's actually the horn of David. Uh, the word horn there speaks of the authority, the power of God through the line of David, which is going to be Jesus when he returns and rules and reigns from Jerusalem. And this description is when Christ comes and rules. So that's why Psalm 132, it's sort of, it, the first part is David wanting to bring God's presence into Jerusalem, but then the, 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 this psalm, sort of the gaze goes past the Jews going up to Jerusalem, and it starts talking prophetically about when the Messiah comes and rules and reigns from Jerusalem. And that's the hope of, of every Jew to this day. They hope the Messiah comes. They just don't know that it's Jesus yet. They will. Uh, that time's coming. Romans chapter 9, 10, 11. Well, quickly, just a couple more. These are some nice short ones for us. It's Psalm 133. Uh, this one here says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So for you essential oil people, this is a nice image for you, as the oil poured on Aaron's running down his beard, you're like, oh, yes, um, that kind of stings a little bit. No, no, I'm just kidding. Here's the thing. Uh, it's kind of hard to picture this. I remember reading this as a kid going, ew oil running down his beard. That's just not an image that makes me go, yeah, that's just so... But do you, do you get a sense, and this is where you kind of got to step back into this century, do you get a sense that they realize this is one of the most beautiful things that they actually see? It, it's like if you and I could picture the most, oh, as I see chocolate running down a bowl of ice cream flowing with a cherry on top. It, you got to kind of picture something like that. Because this is what the Jew, by them saying, like the precious ointment running down air, you have to understand that ointment was costly and it, was, and it smelled good. You know, smells were not so uh, uh, pleasant back in those days. In fact, when you go to the Middle East today, there's still a lot of smells over there that you just kind of need to cover them up with something. That precious ointment made Aaron smell pretty, pretty snazzy. Uh, but it was something that was luxurious and beautiful, and, and, and it, but it was also symbolic of the Lord's anointing upon Aaron as his, he was the priest. And um, there's all kinds of imagery with the oil being the spirit and running down his head through his beard to his clothes. We could, we could talk about all that stuff, but the idea is this is what the Jews would covet. This is what they'd long for. And it points to Jesus as our high priest. In chapter 132, we see Jesus as the king. In chapter 133, we're reminded of Jesus as the high priest. Um, and that he would be their uh, blessing life forevermore. Now, by the way, this idea of behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Do you know that this is something that you and I have to be careful about? Because uh, as Christians, I have noticed we, we are very divided. And, and we have to be careful. So I was talking about churches earlier tonight um, with smoke and lights. And some of you were probably saying, yeah, but preach it, man. We don't want smoke and lights, those churches. But that's not really what I was saying. What I was saying was they're just a different flavor. And it would be sort of dishonest for me as a pastor to have smoke and lights because that's just kind of not really who God's called me to be, nor has he put that on our heart as a leadership team as the way to do it. Um, and so, great. But with all that said, just because a church has smoke and lights, does that mean they're evil? Does that not mean that they're less of Christians than we are? See, this is where we have to go, wait a minute, be careful. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. You see, there, is, there are things that separate us, like false doctrine or wrong teaching. Of course. But we have to be careful. On the essential doctrines, yes, we need to be unified. But there's a lot of things churches teach that are not uh, the same as what we teach. We have differing opinions about what the Bible teaches. And, and those are not essential doctrines. And, and um, we've done teachings, by the way, if you're interested. What are the essential doctrines? Um, we've done whole teachings on it. Look that up if you're interested. Because that's an important thing to know. 
And man, if a church has different flavors and different styles of worship or, you know, some, you know, uh, you know, people, you know, if they're swinging from the chandeliers, you hear me joke around, you know, about uh, their, our, our charismatic brothers and sisters. And, and, and people, you know, the Baptists think we're charismatic, but the charismatics think we're Baptists because we believe in speaking in tongues. We believe what the Bible teaches about pro- the word of prophecy and healing. We believe that and we see that here at Athey Creek. But are we flopping in the aisle? No. Why? Right, where's the floppers? And, and see, here's where it is. I believe the Bible doesn't teach that people are supposed to flop in the aisle. It doesn't say anything about flopping in the aisle. Slaying in the Spirit. Nowhere in the Bible do you see slaying in the Spirit. So I disagree with my brothers and sisters who slay people in the Spirit in services. Well, Brett, I've been slain in the Spirit and I fell over. Can God use our goofy things? He sure does here at Athey Creek. The goofy things that we do and stuff, sure. He uses our goofy stuff. And the Lord can use whatever. He can use even, you know, some teaching. I think sometimes it's a little off, but the Lord still loves those people. See, here's what we have to do. We can talk about what's the, what the Bible teaches and what, it, what, it, what, it, what is true, but there's, some, there's gonna be different flavors in churches and different styles of ministry, and that's okay. We gotta celebrate that. It's where we get off on the essential doctrines. That's where we get uh, very clear. For example, um, you know, Brett, why are you always talking about the Mormons and Jehovah's Witness? And you always talk about that. Because see, that's where they've crossed essential doctrine lines. Jesus of the Mormon is not the Jesus of, of the Christian. The Mormons try very hard to make it look very much like the Jesus of Christianity, but it's not. You know, the Christian Jesus is God who became a man and lived among us. The Mormon says, no, that's not the way it is. That's a different Jesus. Same with the Jehovah's Witness. They, they don't believe in the same Jesus. So there's some essential doctrines there that got us off course. Um, but, uh, but the different flavors... Man, I think we, we should be united. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, um, you know, in, in John 13, 35, uh, it says this, um, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And this is where you and I have to be careful because we live in a very contentious culture. And it's so easy for us to quickly go to, well, we disagree on that, and we disagree on that, and we can start becoming very stingy, looking down our theological noses at people on the non-essential doctrines and, and, and start to look kind of hateful and mean. Um, we have to be careful on that one. Uh, isn't it interesting in John, uh, it's, it, you know, Jesus talked about you know, um, this in John 17, 21. He said, this was a prayer, a beautiful prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. But he, in the middle of his prayer, he says, oh, that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Jesus prayed, oh, that my people, the Christians, would be one, that the world would believe that you have sent me, that I am the Messiah. And I sometimes feel like we drop that ball when we're not loving with other believers just because of little differences in our doctrines, the smaller doctrines, not the essential doctrines. So be careful on that. Maybe you and I both can be careful to, to, to try to, to uh, affirm what is good and approve what is excellent and then be careful about uh, the other stuff. Uh, tricky, tricky, but important. Well, uh, so there it is. One more Psalm of Ascent and then we'll pack it up for the night. And this is the last one, uh, Psalm 134. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord that made heaven and earth, bless thee out of Zion. Um, if you can sort of imagine the Jews making their way up to Jerusalem and they finally get there, they're finally seeing what they were all longing to see as they come over the mountain. They're standing there on the Temple Mount and millions of Jews gathered at these festivals and feasts. What do you do there? Bless the Lord. All ye servants of the Lord, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. It's just a big celebration it's a time to worship. It's, uh, it's a time to just acknowledge that it's the Lord who's the one who made heaven and earth and to be blessed in Zion. That, that's, that's what you and I get to do. Now, now, some of you might think, well, Brett, we have to do the same process. As they made their way up to Jerusalem. See, this is why I'm so thankful as Christians of the New Testament church, we don't have to make our way up to, to the Psalms of Ascents. Why? 
Hebrews tells us, you and I, we get to enter into the holiest. Could these Jews ever hope to walk into the Holy of Holies? No, they would have been dead had they done that. Only Aaron the high priest or the descendants of Aaron the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was ripped in two. Can you imagine the priest dusting off the altar of incense all of a sudden, whoosh, there he is standing there seeing the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, what, what do you do? Run for your life? I mean, because man, you're not supposed to be in there. But the veil was ripped. So what do you do? Well, you have to understand, Hebrews tells us that you and I as New Testament believers, because Jesus died on the cross, we get to enter into the holiest by a new and living way. We have access to God's presence. We have access to God's glory. And it's not something you climb up to or hope to enter in. Uh, if you're good enough, we're there. You can lift up your hands in the sanctuary of your car and bless the Lord because he's there. You have access to the Holy of Holies in your bedroom, in your bathroom, at your workplace. We don't have to work our way through the tabernacle or through the temple because Jesus is the new and living way that we get to access and we have the presence of God. Lo, I am with you always. The Jews had to go up to Jerusalem to get that sense. We and Jews today who believe in Jesus, we've got Christ with us all the time. And that's why we get to worship him all the time. Amen? Amen. Well, Lord, tonight as we look at these Psalms of Ascents, um, what a joyous and glorious thing for those Jews in those days. But how much better it is, Lord, for us. By a new and living way, as you died on the cross for our sins, Lord, giving us the hope of heaven and eternal life through your Son, that we get to commune with you, talk with you, that you're enthroned today on the praises of your people. Lord, that your church gets to have your presence with them throughout each day, all day. Lord, you're so glorious and you're worthy to receive all glory. Lord, I pray also that you'd give us that right mind of rightly dividing the word, but at the same time loving our brothers and sisters who might be a little different than, than we are, different flavors of ministry. But give us that balance, no, knowing when to stand firm on essential doctrines, but also knowing when to just be loving and, and approving that which is excellent. Give us that perfect balance. But Lord, may we be loving. I pray that they would know we're disciples by our love one for another. And so, Lord, bless this, your congregation, as we go our way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Lord bless you. Give someone a handshake or a hug and then you can be dismissed.